snow that blanketed our city. I was scrolling through Facebook and um, I saw somebody's post and uh, the post said, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And accompanying the post was a picture of a living room with a decorated Christmas tree and a view through the picture windows with snow falling outside. Now, normally I would scroll past an update like that, but for some reason, this time it jumped out at me. And I started thinking about it a little bit more because in my friend's mind, one of the features about Christmas is that there is snow on the ground or there are snowflakes gently falling. And um, basically, it's an image of a Christmas card. It's an image that we have been force-fed for many years and we don't even realize that someone has been rewiring our brains. So it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Really? For someone like me who grew up at the equator, <laughs> where it's always, if you've been to Uganda, it's always a perfect 23 to 27 degrees. Christmas does not look like that. For people in South America, <laughs> in Australia, Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia, that's, that's not what Christmas looks like, does it? But it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. The heat is turned up. You know, everybody's sitting around on some plush cushioned chair and there's a dusting of snow outside and we all have a cup of hot chocolate or eggnog or apple cider and the family is gathered around a real or fake Christmas tree and there's the generic Christmas music playing in the background and turkeys wafting through the house because there's one in the oven and kids are tearing into presents that they will forget they got three months later. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, isn't it? And yet, on the outskirts of Mumbai, a family wakes up from crowded living conditions, a mom and dad are waking up to, the, to a day of hustling and scraping by, unsure where the next meal is going to come from. On, on the shores of Libya, families are getting into a makeshift raft, hoping to cross the Mediterranean Sea because life in Syria or Eritrea or Chad or Central African Republic is so unbearable that they would rather die at sea then stay another day in the country of their birth. Orphans are waking up in the favelas of Rio and they're making their way down to the tourist spots to pick the pocket of some unsuspecting tourist. Uh, it's, beginning to lock, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Oh, shut up. You see, the thing about Christmas is that the story behind it is a really intriguing story. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've, you know this story. If you've never really been a part of church, you still kind of know the gist of it because it's everywhere. There's nativity scenes everywhere. But the Christmas story has very little to do with our programmed feelings of Christmas nostalgia. Because you see, what is happening on this day thousands of years ago is that a young mom has traveled a great distance with her husband. And in their desperation to find a place to stay, they accept lodging in a stable. She actually goes into labor in the stable and she gives birth in a pretty unhygienic situation. And the only people who hear about this occasion and come to check on them are some poor, smelly farmhands who are watching sheep outside the town. You see, the savior of the world, the man who would change history, the man in whose name people would raise up civilizations and others would grind them into the dust, this man, was born without any pomp and circumstance, apart from some angels startling some poor shepherds and singing, glory to God in the highest. And perhaps this is why in the first reading we had at the beginning of the service, the writers of John's gospel say this, he was in the world. The world was there through him and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they did not want him.
And perhaps this is a reason why in a season like this, thousands of years removed from the first pretty and uh, first not so pretty and smelly Christmas, we've done everything we can to scrub it clean. You see, what's the furthest thing from a mother in labor in a stable? Our comfy, warm living rooms with big picture windows looking outside to snow softly falling on a December morning. I mean, <laughs> could you get any further from the real thing? Now, hear me when I say this. I only slightly, slightly mock our Christmas traditions. I do not think that it is wrong once every year to find an excuse to travel across the country, to be with friends and family. I don't think it's an excuse to find a chance to share a meal together and hang out together and give presents. You know, as, as, much, as, there is, as, as much as there is a lot to gripe about in this Christmas season and the excesses of it, I actually think that it is a good thing that families get together and share love and brief moments of joy. You see, in our world where people use fear and suspicion to divide us, I think it's an awesome thing that we have a season like this where things can be just a little bit lighter, where we can take a breather and focus on other things that bind us together rather than the things that divide us. But as a follower of Christ and a believer in an improbable story, but it's also a world-changing story, I have to ask you all, I couldn't let this opportunity pass by without asking you all to reframe your Christmas story. I have to ask you to find space in your annual narrative for the story of the savior of the world coming to us in the most humble of circumstances. And I have to ask you to make, at least consider making Christmas more about a celebration of family and friends and make it about a celebration of something even more special, a celebration of sacrifice. If you didn't know it, the people who've made the most biggest uh, positive influences on our human history have one thing in common. They live lives of incredible sacrifice. Somehow, at some point in their lives, they turn a corner and they start to live with a perspective that is bigger than their short lives. And this enables them to have an impact that lasts many years after they're dead and gone. Now, the sacrifices of these people that we revere and we build monuments to them are only a dim reflection of a sacrifice that I think is so much bigger. You see, the reason why we remember Jesus is not because he was a great teacher. There are many great teachers who have come and gone, and we have forgotten them. It's not because he was a controversial historical figure. It is because of something much, much bigger. He was about the business of making his life a sacrifice. The kind of sacrifice that would turn the world on its axis and bring about a peace and love to humanity that they could only grasp at but never really know. And I think that this is ultimately the reason why Christ is remembered to this day. It is because through his sacrifice, you can find a kind of grace and mercy and love that you cannot find anywhere else. And every single thing that is available to us in grace and mercy and love comes to us through faith. Now, I'll be the first to freely admit this. Coming to the place of believing that some Jewish zealot from thousands of years ago has any relevance in my life today is a pretty big leap. And as a matter of fact, that's why we call it a leap of faith. But the thing that you find when you leap is you find a world that you did not know before. A world that you could not have imagined is opened up to you. John says this about those that take the leap. We read it earlier. But whoever did want him, whoever believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves. 
the child of God selves. You see, your child of God self, your true self, is an amazing revelation if you did not know. As another writer in the Bible says, you know, you get to experience life on God's terms. So even though we may face the confusion of life, we are able to live with a freedom and a peace and a joy that is self-sustaining. We can live lives free of the ugliness of fear and judgment and condemnation and find avenues of grace and mercy and love that literally change the stories of our lives and the lives of people around us. Your child of God self, if you did not know, is a self that can walk through life with a swagger that has nothing to do with your personal achievements, but has everything to do with an identity and a purpose that is bigger than the myopic pursuits of a short and pointless life. Somehow, when you step out in faith, this is what is unlocked in your life. Your true self, your child of God self. Christmas is about an unlikely arrival, the arrival of Jesus. And this season is so much more than the holiday card caricature that we have reduced it to. It is so much more than half-hearted attempts at showing care and love for family. It is about heaven tearing through space and time and the Son of God coming to us without pomp and circumstance and going about the business of saving humanity that didn't even know it needed saving. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. With Jesus in the frame, this infuriating, confusing, intriguing, controversial, challenging, life-changing son of a carpenter, this Jesus, when he's in the frame, I think Christmas changes. And I invite each one of you this holiday to make him a part of your Christmas. You see, this is how much God loved the world. He sent his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. You see, God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help put the world right again. Amen. <laughs>